2007 is when they started in this program. And so, uh, as I said earlier, they're the, the newest uh, graduates of this Rowan program. Uh, we promise to make this Q&A less rigorous than your dissertation defense, but you never know what you're going to get here. I would just like to set it up by saying uh, this big idea project, uh, more than anything else, it's all wrapped up in student success, student completion of degrees, and uh, three different flavors you heard of that, three different slices. Uh, we heard from Jennifer that, uh, uh, like it or not, and I guess we don't, too many students, I think it's uh, in, in New Jersey, about 80% of our students come to us in need of remediation. The math side is particularly uh, a difficult challenge, and uh, I learned tonight that uh, many of these students come to us, take the placement test, not having had math in a <laughs> year or two even, and not really fully appreciating what a big, high-stakes test this uh, is. I uh, learned from Elvie that a, a working mom with two children is ineligible for financial aid. So, you know, affordability, we've got academic challenges to student success. We've got financial challenges to student success as well. And from Scott, uh, some of our colleges are now teaching 80% plus of their credit hours with adjunct faculty. So if we're going to be good at student success, we've got to be, become better at engaging adjunct faculty in the whole process. And Scott, I was sitting next to Dr. Gaber, who's chairing, co-chairing the work group looking at adjuncts and, uh, and how to do that. And he leaned over and sked, said, get Scott on our group. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, you are? Good. Oh, yeah, well, so Ron, if you want to monitor this Q&A. Okay. And uh, you had a slide, one of your slides, you had a comment in there that you glossed over. And I thought it was uh, potentially controversial and right on target, and I'd like you to comment it more. You make a reference to accented teachers and their impact on uh, developmental students. And you, you uh, referenced um, uh, training on, on reducing the accent. And I'd like your suggestions on how I could do that and keep myself out of the chronicle of higher education and retain my job. I think it's a great, I think it's a great suggestion. Obviously, universally, I, I, we believe in uh, diversity within our community college systems. What The feedback, though, that we got from the students was that it's very difficult for a student whose native language, say, is Spanish, to go into a class that's taught by someone whose native language is Polish because there's a, a, a dis disconnect. It makes it much more difficult. And the comments came on, I understood this faculty member. I understood them when they spoke English. Um, so here, it's, it's really to what, what we personally did was we <coughs> launched a new course called Accent Reduction for the Professional. And we, we geared it towards our own faculty member, both adjunct and um, full-time, um, with the idea that especially in math when you have very many people that are from other countries that you know are good at math but their English is not perfect and it, it does create a barrier um, so it may not be politically as you said politically correct to, to attack that but I think that most faculty members do want to improve themselves also we are in a role of continuous improvement for everyone involved in the community college system so um, I do think that that a faculty member does need to be understood. So, and sometimes we'll see people don't make tenure because they can't be understood. So, time to attack that elephant too. Thank you. Question: ooh, Don't move. Question for Jennifer. Um, with your refresher class, are you advocating teaching to the test, which I know in in school is not the thing to do. But on that, almost the opposite. Really here what we're saying is, you, you may have done your decimals, and I, in my full presentation I have examples um, from the AccuPlacer, and it tends to be the seven times eight questions and the decimal here and there. It, it's you, the idea is that if you had learned it at some point, it may be dusty, and you need to take it out of the closet and <coughs> dust it off, and then you'll have those basic skills. But if you haven't, and you're just tested like this, you may not be able to retrieve them that rapidly. So I would say, in, in, a, in effect, no really we are trying to establish. We want the faculty members to have all of the skill sets for their students that the students need. We don't want to do any, we're not doing any short sheeting here, you know, and I think that's very important to keep to those standards. Thank you. Anyone else? Great. Hi, I'm Laura Valderrama. I'm the alumni trustee at Warren County Community College, and I just have a comment on the adjunct um, faculty. Um, that 
adjunct teachers are fabulous. I mean, being in class, you really can't tell the difference. The, where, uh, from a student's perspective, the struggle is office hours. It's really hard to, to reach out to the adjuncts when um, they are barely on campus aside of teaching in class. So I think that's just something that I want to just point out and you know have everyone be aware that adjunct teachers are they're greatly appreciated. But it's just the office hours maybe is something that needs to be looked into, you know, and and maybe have um, more requirements for it. That was a topic that came up consistently in my focus groups and my interviews and a number of the adjuncts pointed out that they feel as if they live in their car. Many of them teach at multiple campuses or moving from point A to point B with limited time. There's no magic formula to resolve this. You know, I encourage them, make yourself available 10 minutes before, during break, 10 minutes after. And at Brookdale uh, in the English department, we set aside a room where if they can come at a different time, they put that on the website, they make their classes aware. So it could be external to the time when the class meets. But nonetheless, many of them teach different classes on different days. So if you have them on a Tuesday, you might well be able to see them on a Wednesday. But, but you're correct. In, in the long run, it, it remains a concern. Did you differentiate in your study adjuncts were teaching via distance as opposed to via land and was there a differing response to uh, either interviews or the survey you did or didn't you do that? These were adjuncts who all taught face-to-face -face classes who were very interested in teaching online instruction but you know how the pecking order goes. Many of them had taken the course and qualified to teach it, but there were still enough full-time faculty who by right of first refusal hadn't freed any of them up for them to teach. So moving forward, we now have a few, it's a year after my study, who are teaching online, but at the time of my study, none were. I just have a question for LV. I was delighted when somebody took on the really amorphous question of affordability. Um, I'm wondering if since your study you've had any thoughts about what this group should do or ways in which we can look at statewide the question of affordability and maybe help define that tipping point. Got any suggestions for us? I think um, it's never a single approach. I think it's a multi-approach. I think within our institutions we need to develop the culture of informing students and, and having consistent policies that are clear and easy to find on the web and in various ways. I think as a president, I'm sure you guys are, are you, you, I should stop saying you guys. <laughs> Sorry, it's a Jersey term. But you should um, look at av av advocacy, um, I think, and continue, really, that whole tripartite um, is not working. It's not true. We almost need to stop talking about it being three ways. Um, and, you know, because that's really a, a big misconception. You know, and students also, I, I sometimes wonder whether we shouldn't work with our students more to get them to understand, because we do have students who think that because you're coming to a public institution that it's going to be free. So we still have a few people who still have that idea that they're going to come from community college and that what they have to pay. And so that, that's still out there, which is the public then isn't very clear as to how we're funded. And I think that they themselves, the students, could be advocates for us. And I think we need to coach them on how to be advocates for us. And we need to figure out more how we want to define ourselves in terms of the funding. Because, you know, if we keep holding on to that tripartite, that's not, and it isn't serving as well to say it. And we keep competing with each other for state funding that doesn't seem to get any bigger then we need to get better at um, figuring out how we talk about it. That's the most, that's the, the beginning of it. That's a great answer. I could, we could use you at our trustee seminar and talk about advocacy. <laughs> uh, who's next? I will ask one question regarding the third, the third, and the third, which is right. obviously not going to come back. Uh, in your studies, did you uh, address more thoroughly the capacity issues that obviously we are going to need with the increased enrollment that we've experienced and how that relates to your part of the study? I mean, when we see enrollment, of course, because we're all competitive with each other, we think our enrollment goes up, we're going to get that money. So we all want to see it. I think we're addressing the enrollment sometimes in different ways and for, by providing online courses and then we don't need to keep having our physical buildings or by building partnerships with people in the community, then you offer classes in other places. Um, I, would, I would really, I'm a staunch believer that we are the only way that um, the public has access to democratic 
way of being educated. So I would hate for us to be in conversations that it would be limiting open access. And that would be something that's a passion for me. You know, um, when I related to a lot of the students because my family, were they were immigrants that came from Portugal in 1974. I got educated in the Newark public school system, okay? And I got really lucky that I had a great counselor who told me that I should pursue a degree. And my parents wanted me to go to college, but they had no way to figure out how to fund it. I was just supposed to be kind of magically going. So there was no <laughs> little pot of money to send me off or whatever. They decided to move back just when I wanted to enter school. So I was faced with going with them back to Portugal or staying here. And I went with them thinking, you know, stay with a family. That's important. Go over there. I was supposed to go to Coimbra, which is one of the oldest universities um, in, in Europe. I was accepted to go. And I know that there they would only pay like a minimal fee. But I didn't know what opportunities there were there for me as a woman. And I felt that here I had a better chance. And I went to a private school, Hood College, which is a women's college in Maryland. And they put a nice packet together because I didn't know that I was a minority, <laughs> but I was a minority. <laughs> so I got financial aid and I was a minority. So I got some money and I didn't know what minority meant, but I knew that my roommate, her parents just wrote a check and she just kept going. And I knew that I had financial aid and I had to do my work study. So when I spoke to a lot of these students, that's where they were coming from. They were coming from first generation, coming to school, their parents didn't know how to get them here, but they knew that if they go to college, they, they just get a better chance of getting a, a job. And I know a lot about jo jobs and workforce, so I agreed with them. And I felt that I could never be doing what I'm doing now if I hadn't persisted and I hadn't done it. So I really spoke to them about that when I had my conversations about not quitting, about how important education is, even if education is only to just improve your accent or whatever it is, it doesn't matter, you just keep going. And you know, that's what we spoke about. And when they see my master's uh, degree hanging up in my office, which I got from Montclair State, they, want, they talk about wanting to go to Montclair State. And I said, you just make that your goal. You don't stop. And that's when even when going to Rowan. Rowan was not easy. Working full time, being a mom, and being an associate dean for a branch campus that's 20 miles away from a main campus, it wasn't easy. So I don't sugarcoat it and say that everything's going to open the doors or that we're going to find the pot of gold and they're all going to come to school. But I think we need to work at that because they have the desire and we exist for that purpose, the fact that they have that desire. So we, you got to make that match. And if we want to exist and deliver to them and be able to help them, then we have to look at that. We have to look at how we get funded and we have to keep opening those doors. So don't shut the doors. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You made me so much <laughs>